Every farmer wants to get maximum production with minimum inputs. We all know that water is crucial for crop production. Hello farmers and welcome to the Kenyan farmer. I will start with a question. How do you estimate soil moisture in your farm? Knowing how to monitor soil moisture of your farm is quite important. And there are survival skills that farmers have gathered over time to get this estimate. Waiting until the plants start wilting is not the best way, or in some cases, it may be too late. This way reminds me how my grandfather used to check soil moisture, or how my grandma would check if the baked cake is ready. You see, she could use a sharp pin. If you are as old as I am, then you know the kind of pins that was used long time ago by ladies to knit sweaters by hand. She could stick that pin into the cake and when she pulled it out and it was clean, it meant that the cake was ready. In this case, a farmer can know that the soil is dry. But if after drawing the pin and she realized it had some cake sticking on it, she could understand that the cake was not ready yet. And in such a case, now the farmer will realize that there is some moisture in the soil. This method may seem outdated, but it still works for most small-scale Kenyan farmers. But when it comes to large-scale farmers, there are more accurate methods to get such data. I mean, at that level, they can't leave anything to chance. Today, I want to talk about soil moisture and why you should be concerned. Water used for crop production in Kenya is mainly from rainfall. If it fails to rain, then we lose our crop. If it rains enough, some of the water will run off, some will go deep into very deep layers or even the water table, but some of it is left in the soil. The portion or amount of rain that is left in the soil is called effective rainfall and this portion is what benefits the crop. I think it will be unfair if I can't explain how generally soil holds water. You know that soil is made up of particles. These particles have spaces and gaps. If you zoom into the soil, this may be clear. Now, what happens when you pour water on the soil? The water will wet the soil and fill all the air spaces. Once these air spaces are full and the soil cannot take any more, then excess water will just run off. At this level, the soil has reached its saturation capacity. Most crops will not perform well at saturation point unless you are growing special crops like rice. Rice works better in flood irrigation, but other crops like popo will just rot and fall down. Now, if you take a saturated soil sample and allow gravity to drain the water, the water that is left in that soil sample is what is called field capacity. At this level, the water left is usually sticking around the soil particles due to cohesion or addition. This layer of water is now what is utilized by our plants. It is what is beneficial to the crop. Plant roots will absorb this water for plant growth. Some of this water will also evaporate to the atmosphere. If the crop exhausts this water, then it will start wilting. This level where there is no available water to plant roots, then it's commonly called the wilting point. And as a farmer, you don't want to get to this point because your plant will surely die. The amount of water between the field capacity all the way down to permanent wilting point is called total available water. But you will find there is a threshold called optimum moisture level. Above this level, the crop will absorb water from the soil stress-free, and so production isn't affected negatively. However, below this optimum level, the plant will have to use a lot of energy just to get water. It will have to strain. 
So it makes sense as a farmer that you will want your moisture level to oscillate between the field capacity and the optimum moisture level. This is the region where we have readily available water. And as long as the crop is healthy, the necessary nutrients are available and the environment is conducive, then we can expect good production. Actually, you know even below the permanent wilting point, there is still some water left in the soil. But this water is strongly held that the plant roots cannot extract. Nevertheless, that does not count. It still does not benefit the crop. So, how does a plant lose water? Water can be lost from the soil surface or even the plant surfaces by evaporation, especially during daytime when there is sun. If you can remember high school biology classes, when you zoom into plant leaf cells, you will see specialized cells called stomata. Plants use this pair of cells to breathe. They take in carbon dioxide and they release excess moisture or water from the crop, a process called transpiration. So plants will lose water through evaporation and transpiration. Combination of these processes can be collectively called evapotranspiration. This water lost by a plant during growth is important and is what is called the crop water need commonly abbreviated as ET crop. You can look at it as the amount of water needed to meet the water loss by evapotranspiration. As a farmer, you should know that crop water need depend on many factors like the crop type. We know that rice will obviously need a lot of water as compared to beans. Plants like popo will just die in waterlogged conditions. Growth stage of a crop also affects crop water need. Let me see if I can represent the different growth stages of a crop in a graph. And let's work with horticultural crops like French beans or maybe cabbage. At the early stages or the seedling stage, the plant does not require as much water, but as the plant is growing, it requires more water. You can't afford to stress the crop at sensitive stages like flowering or fruit set that can negatively affect production. For such crops that need to be harvested when still fresh, crop water needs may not significantly drop towards the harvesting, maybe just a small drop. There is also some other crops that do not require too much water especially during the ripening or towards the final harvesting stage. An example of such crops are field beans. Once they are mature, they don't require as much water. They are left to wilt and dry before harvesting. The crop water need at the late stage reduces drastically. The length of the growing period of a crop also affects crop water needs. If the crop takes longer to mature, then it will require more water. Another factor that affects crop water need is the climate. Crops grown in dry hot areas will require more water obviously, especially when it is very windy. Hot, dry and windy environments will increase evapotranspiration. There are many other management factors that affect crop water need, but let's leave that for another video. We have seen that Crop water needs is met by irrigation or from the rainfall. And as we have said, it's only the effective rainfall that is crucial to our crop. If you have enough rainfall, then you don't need irrigation. If the rainfall is not enough, then you have to supplement with some form of irrigation. And if there is completely no rainfall, then all the crop water needs is met by irrigation. It is possible for crops to get water from deeper horizons or to rise up from the water table. But in Kenya, unless you are farming on a wetland, that contribution is negligible and we will not consider that. There are various ways used to estimate evapotranspiration. 
And if you're interested, you can visit the FAO website to understand more. I want to talk about the reference crop evapotranspiration. Imagine we have grass planted on a big area, actively growing and not short of water. The grass is about 10 to 15 centimeters tall, covering the whole area. We then measure its evapotranspiration at different times of the year. The values measured are used as reference crop evapotranspiration, commonly denoted as ET0 or ET ref. So, if you want to estimate evapotranspiration of another crop under similar conditions as our reference crop, then we just multiply the reference crop evapotranspiration with the crop coefficient of that new crop. That's simple. Different crops will have different crop coefficients that also matches along with its growth stage. Evapotranspiration is measured in millimeters per day, millimeters per month, or even millimeters per growth season. An example, if the reference crop evapotranspiration is 2 millimeters a day, it means for you to meet the evapotranspiration losses for our reference crop, then we need to provide 2 millimeters height of water. So, let's see if you can calculate crop water need for cabbage. Huh? We have crop coefficients at various stages and we have also been provided with the reference crop evapotranspiration rates for the period we will be planting the crop. Let's imagine we will plant the cabbage between the months of January through to April. To make the months easy, let's also imagine that the growth stages of the cabbage will coincide perfectly with the months. We can first tabulate the data and using the formula, we get the evapotranspiration rate per day. And we are interested in the whole month or in this case for each growth stage. So we multiply by 30. You can now see that we have an estimate of 567 millimeters of water for the whole season. Okay, that's fine. But in real life, it does not always work like that. It's not that straight. The duration of growth stages of the cabbage is as shown. You can see that the duration or the growth stages do not fit perfectly to the months. And so we adjust accordingly. Let's now do it the proper way. Same crop, same data. Let's see. In January, we have 20 days of the crop under initial stage and we also have 10 days under development stage. In Feb, we still have 15 days under development and 15 days under mature stage. Please note that each month is treated to be having 30 days. At the end, you'll find that you have calculated the crop water need to be approximately 620 millimeters for that season. Alternatively, you may decide to approach the problem in a different way. You can change the provided KC values by considering the months so that you have a new average of KC values to work with. I mean, like in January, 20 days out of 30 are under initial growth and then the remaining 10 days of the same month are under development stage. If you add these ratios, you'll get 0.55, which will now be our new KC value for January. You continue the same way for all the months so that you can get a new set of KC values. You use these new values with the reference crop evapotranspiration to get the daily crop evapotranspiration and the monthly crop evapotranspiration. And you will find the total crop water need is about 620 millimeters for that season just as we calculated earlier now there are also many other factors which have to be considered when doing such calculations this figure we have calculated is under standard conditions we have been assuming all the way that we have been operating under ideal or perfect conditions but that cannot be the actual condition at the farm Management factors can be different. At some point, 
the soil moisture will fall below the optimum moisture level. And in such a case, you have to adjust the ideal Kc value with the water stress coefficient. It can easily get overwhelming to a farmer, I know. But the good thing is that there are softwares available for such tasks, which makes life easier. An example of a common software is called CropWart. You can download, input your primary data, and you can get the estimates automatically. That's enough for today. I hope you have found today's video to be interesting too. There is so much to be discussed about this subject. Remember to visit the FAO website for more information. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, share and subscribe. See you in the next video and God bless you.